Nemo Radio is on the air. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C. Closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! Hey, it's John Nemo. Wanted to hit record here because I'm throwing a Hail Mary. (laughs) I'm trying to rescue a couple sales. And it's so interesting. There's so many learning lessons. I'm almost recording this more for me than anything else. But like the first lesson is you only learn if you're in the arena. You only learn through quote unquote failure. Okay. And that's the big lie. I think that a lot of sales trainers, sales gurus, you know, people promise, oh man, my closing framework, you know, it's so easy. But like the end of the day, here's the problem with this is you're still dealing with humans, right? You're still dealing with people and people are emotional creatures. I remember reading this in Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People book from 1936. And he said, you're not dealing with creatures of logic. You're not dealing with fact-based, logical, rational people. You're dealing with creatures of emotion, emotion. And so the the whole backdrop to this is I had two separate sales, big significant sales for our done for you LinkedIn lead generation agency that I got a verbal yes. It's, you know, on it on a call. And this hap- this happens a lot, right? I and mean, anyone who's done sales knows this, like, a verbal yes doesn't mean anything until you have a signed contract and the first payment in, right? <laughs> like, and, and that's just the dynamic of it is like, People can say yes and give you the verbal, oh, yeah, I'm moving forward. Let's do it. Send the paperwork. And then until that paperwork gets signed and until the payment comes through, like I don't count it as a sale. I don't activate the team. And so what was so interesting and what I want to break down in these two sales that and again, they they aren't completely dead, complete failures. They aren't like a hard no. In both cases, it was the same objection, which is so fascinating to me. Um, and and it, fra- it brings up a couple different ideas. One is, is the objection I'm getting in both instances the real objection? And that's one of the hardest and most important parts of any sales process or sales conversation is, is this the real reason you don't want to move forward? And you have to find a polite way to do that, to peel every layer of the onion off until you get to the core. And, you know, it can be really difficult because... Oftentimes, you have invested so much into the sales process on your side, and you're emotional, and you got the high and the excitement of them saying yes, and then a day later, they're backing out, and you know all this stuff, and so you have to stay calm and stay rational and not like snap at someone, right, and criticize and say, you know, there's a part of you that always wants to say, dude, you said yes, we had a deal. You're going back on your word? Like, come on. You know, like there's that part of you that feels that way um, and wants to like go after the person. And then there's the other part of you that wants to look at the person and say, well, come on, logically, what you're saying makes no sense. Again, Carnegie, you're not dealing with creatures of logic. You're dealing with emotional creatures. And so in the case of these two sales, what's so interesting is in both cases, the individuals involved said the formal thing was, you know, the timing's just not right. I need more time. Um, I, you know, I need to figure out my timing. I need to figure out da 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 da. And so it's interesting how I reacted and how I learned, right? Because being in the trenches, you just, you immediately want to react. And so with the first person, it's interesting. I, I, and both of them did it via email, right? So they didn't call me. So it's, it's not like it's in the heat of the moment. So I have time to think and write a response. And so just looking at my two responses I just did with the first person who said, the timing's just not right. I want to wait, blah, blah, blah. I wrote back and I kind of see where I made a mistake in the sense of I tried to argue logically and I I didn't follow all the steps now that I know, which I did in the second email. But the first email I just wrote back and was like, well, logically, you know, as we talked about on the call, like, you know, the timing's perfect for this reason and this reason and this reason. Like, logically, I thought we dealt with the timing objection. You know, logically, this is what we said about the timing and this would work perfect, wouldn't it? And I'm realizing that's how I'm thinking about it. Instead, for the second person who said the same thing, I used a technique I learned from Josh Braun, a sales trainer, and I think he credits Chris Voss with it, the um, Never Split the Difference book guy, but it's called labeling. And it's basically 
the person said, uh, the second person said something along the lines of, you know what, I've done a lot of soul searching. I've done a lot of thinking about this. Like the timing's not right. I want to make sure I'm available and fully, fully available. This, this, and this. Okay. So like went on about the timing, timing, timing. And so in the second instance, I didn't respond with the logical part. I didn't lead with that anyway. And so, well, logically the timing is actually perfect. We talked about that on the sales call. Here's why I said, instead I labeled, I said, it sounds like you're feeling really overwhelmed. That's labeling. It sounds like you have a lot going on. It sounds like blank and that's labeling. So that's the other person then feels validated. You're saying, it sounds like you really have a lot on your plate right now. And that you can almost hear the person reading the email and they're nodding their head. Yeah, man, that's totally it. It sounds like you just feel, and I said something like, it sounds like you feel like you're just running around nonstop or running around like a chicken with their head cut off, right? And I'm sure the person's not like, yes, exactly right. And so then I pivoted and I, I led with empathy, right? Because I know the person's situation, right? They own a business, they're running a business. And I said, you know, in my own experience, I have found that the timing will never be good, will never be perfect. In my own experience, I've been waiting 10 years for the time that I feel like, oh man, I got nothing on my plate. I'm fully ready to take this on. I got nothing else to worry about. Timing's perfect. Let's go. <laughs> like I'm still waiting for that. I have this running joke with my family where I always say, oh, I'm taking the summer off. You know, I'm not working long hours. That's it. You know, and and um, my kids always laugh. They're like, what well, haven't I taken the summer off? I'm like, well, I own the business. Like, it never works out. <laughs> like, something always happens. Something, there's an emergency. A tool broke. A software broke. Uh, this blew up. That blew up. An opportunity presented itself. Like, the time, you know, like, it's never perfect. Like, if you own your own business or run your own business, coach, consultant, small business owner, the timing's never going to be good. And so, I, without being, like, sarcastic or attacking the person, I just said, in, empathized, in my own experience, I've, the timing is never like, is, I think I phrased it this way in my own experience, have I ever found a time when things were settled and good? And, you know, I had plenty of time to think about it. No, like you have to make decisions and move, right. And, and be active. And so I tried to pivot it back that way. First I labeled, it sounds like you're, you have a lot going on. It sounds like you're feeling overwhelmed. It sounds like you've got a million balls in the air, which I know they do, right. They're running a business, right. So I labeled and, and empathized. And then I, you know, said, I can totally relate owning my own business. And then I tried to kind of gently poke at that objection and say, is there ever going to be a good time? You know, and where I wanted to go, but then I stopped because it was only an email. But if I had a conversation, I would just say, you know, again, in my experience, I'm not putting it on them or judging them. Um, what what ends up being a priority for me gets my time and gets my focus, Right. And maybe this, maybe this just isn't a priority for you. Like maybe the, maybe it's not the timing issue. Maybe it's a priority issue of you really don't need this right now. You've got other stuff you're more focused on and and trying to like almost do that consultative approach to selling, um, just to see if that's the real objection. Because if the person comes back and says, oh no, this is top priority. We really, we really need this. Then I would say, well, then if that's the case, wouldn't you make time for it? Like if you're sick or you have a broken bone, like it's you might have a lot on your plate and not be able to be fully available, but you're gonna make time for it to go to the doctor, right? Like you just what what is a priority gets your time. So and that's what we all struggle with, by the way, is we all struggle with prioritizing things and not wasting time. Right. And so the other thing too, like logically, the objection that both people had to timing and I won't be fully available and I have so much else I have to focus on logically I said to them both and again logic isn't enough to probably win this but I basically said well logically all I really need from you is one hour like I literally just need one hour to do your kickoff call and links to your content and then we'll do the rest like for the next 30 days we're going to go underground and do all the work and all the foundation building and all the writing and all the copy and all the content and all the search like we need we just need an hour to talk to you and we're good like you don't need to deal with us for 30 days like so the timing's perfect like go enjoy your vacation get this started before you leave and it's off your plate when you come back you're going to have a new linkedin profile you're going to have this you're going to have this so like logically i'm looking at it going this timing's actually perfect for you right and so that was what we went through on the sales calls where they agreed and then now, you know, and then verbally yes, whatever. And then it was, oh, after thinking about it, soul searching, I, you know, timing's not right. So it's like, now you have to take a step back as the salesperson and go, is that the real issue? 
Is that the real issue? And then how, this is the challenge for me and for everyone is like, how do I gently say, is that the real issue? Right. And Josh Braun and Chris Foss would say, keep labeling. Like, well, it sounds like the timing's a concern. And then you pause and let them say that. It sounds like you have a lot going on. Yes. Label, label, label. Um, it sounds like, you know, and then you can say like, can I ask a, you know, pretty frank question or like just a very direct question? And they can say, sure. And you can say, is there ever going to be a time when you're not stressed? Is there ever going to be a time when you're not running around like chicken with the head cut off? Cause you run your own business. Like there's always going to be stuff going on. So like when is, Oh no, no, no. Like maybe they'll push back and be like, no, no, no. You know, come November, everything's going to be fine. And it's like, really? Cause I've never had that happen in 10 years. Maybe you're different than me. <laughs> like, you know, and at that point, you know, try to get to the real objection, you know, and maybe that is the real objection. Right. And part of what I've learned in sales is, Yes, you want to take people at their word and address the objections on their face. But I've also found that typically if I can talk to them live, I can typically get deeper and go, it's really not about the timing. It's really more about, you know, X, Y, Z emotional thing. Like you really don't know if this is going to work or it's really scary for you to invest this much in your business or you have self-doubt about X, Y, Z. Like, that's always what it is, right? We're all emotional. I'm the same way, right? And I find this, it's so interesting because a lot of times I had another sales call, another random one, perfect example. I had someone come up to me a couple of days ago and say, hey, I want a LinkedIn profile rewrite. I was like, okay, and tell me about your business, right? So we get on the phone, we spend an hour and they're like, yeah, one new client for me, one new customer is ten to $20,000, easy, right? I charge $200 an hour, blah, 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 blah. I've already had a client find me on LinkedIn and I have this bare bones profile, so I know it works. Da 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 da. I was like, wow, okay, great. Well, you know, we can do the full program, we can baby step. They're like, well, what would it be like just to baby step in and just rewrite my profile? And I'm like, it would be X amount of dollars. And they're like, oh, that's really expensive. That costs a lot. I don't know. There's other people who are willing to do it cheaper. And my husband wouldn't want me spending that much, or my wife, or I can't remember who it was, a spouse. Like, my spouse would, I have to talk to them and this and this and this. I go, okay, but you said one new client is twenty fifteen to twenty thousand dollars or whatever it was. I'm like, and the profile is like a tiny fraction of that. So like, where are we mismatched here? Like why? And it really, I think it came down to I was messaging the person afterward because I was just like, I'm not gonna like drag someone or push them hard. I was like, yeah, you know what? Hey, totally. If and I did the Chris Voss, and it sounds like price is an issue, right? Label the issue. Yes, price is a concern. Okay, why is that? Oh, you know, my spouse always will say, go with the cheapest option, right? And and you know, they're not going to know you or like you or trust you like I do, and they're going to think that's overpriced when a competitor of yours will do it for half as much. And I was like, okay, and I addressed the price objection, and here's why we charge what we charge, and why we do things differently, and custom, blah blah blah, and bringing a whole agency versus just a solo person, and don't use templates and all that. And okay, you know, and I said, at the end of the day, like, look, if price is the determining factor, then I'm the wrong person. Like we're going to be the most expensive by a mile. And here's why. Just like when you go to buy a car, if price is the main issue, you're not going to Ferrari and Porsche and Tesla, right? You're going to Hyundai or, you know, Toyota and looking for the cheapest model, right? Like they're both cars. They both drive you places. It's just what, what matches your brand. And so I just said, you know, I said to the person, I'm like, if you want to, if one new client for you is really 15 to 20 K and you charge $200 an hour, I said, but your profile looks like you charge $5 an hour. I mean, I didn't say it this directly, but I, I used it as like school level. I said like your profile right now is like a C minus just cause they asked me like, what do you think of my profile? What do you think of a profile? I'm like, honestly, like C plus at best, very average. Really it was an F. I didn't want to say that to him. I was like, but you already got a client from it who's paying you, you know, 150 bucks an hour. That's amazing. Like, it just shows you people are looking on LinkedIn for your services. Like, you got a client just because you had a couple of keywords in there. Imagine if you had a polished, branded profile with high-end graphics and all the right keywords and all the right copy and all the right visuals, how much easier it would be to get these higher ticket clients and really, you know, match the brand to what you charge. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't, I just, you know, I'm small business. I'm like, Okay, well, chicken and egg, right? I mean, at the end of the day, what really came out when I was messaging the person afterward, because I just said, you know what? Hey, totally fine. If price is the issue, we're not going to be the right fit. Go find somebody on the cheap. I also said, here's free resources. Here's my free, 
you know, profile template, just do something like do something. You can improve it to some degree, right. To get some wins that way. And they're like, do you really think I could make more sales? Do you really think I could have a seven figure business? And I realized, Oh, their issue isn't paying me in budgets. It's self doubt. They don't, they don't really believe in themselves and believe in their business model. Even though they, and like the person I even said, well, tell me about the client I hired you from LinkedIn. Yeah, they found me and said they had this big problem, this big pain point. They need a consultant who does exactly what I did. And so, you know, I, I talked myself down. I wanted to charge 200 an hour, but I said I would do it for 125 an hour. I'm like, why'd you do that? I'm like, they were in immense pain. They called you and said they wanted to hire you. Like, why wouldn't you? But that's that self doubt. They didn't think they're worth 200 an hour or the value or the fear. And that's that piece of it, like where, that isn't going to come out in a typical sales conversation because people aren't going to be like, well, you know, John, the real reason is I doubt myself and I doubt that I could really build a seven figure business, even though, you know, I charge this much and have this much value. And even though people are willing to pay me this much, it's like, well, that's that piece my business coach has taught me about, like with the sales conversation is like, it's not just enough to get the prospect to believe in you and that you can deliver what you promise. You have to get the prospect to believe in themselves and that they can do it. So like in the example of our LinkedIn lead generation services, it's like it's not enough for me just to say, dude, I can get you, you know, hundreds of conversations and dozens of people wanting to talk to you. Right. And all these people ringing your phone off the hook, whatever. That's not enough, because if they don't feel like they can close any leads or they don't feel like they're worth charging two hundred dollars an hour, they're going to self-sabotage. They're not going to call the leads. They're not going to close the deals. That's where you and me, like on the call, have to be like, you, and I've done this so many times with coaches and consultants. I'm like, why don't you believe in yourself? Why don't you see the value you're bringing? Like, why don't you believe you're worth 200 an hour? You just told me, like, if you, like this person said, yeah, a lot of my clients that I work with, if I fix the problem, it saves them potentially millions of dollars. I go, so if I'm a business owner and I come to you and you solve this problem that could have cost me millions of dollars you think i'm gonna have a problem paying you twenty thousand dollars heck no right like you'd save me millions like so why don't you believe in yourself right and that's where you have to like pump the other person's tires and mindset and that's where it all gets back to mindsets the whole game for everybody and so what's so interesting to me is you forget that like if you just take people at face value and what they present to you uh, on the sales call and you only take the objections at face value you're oftentimes going to get frustrated. At least I do, because I'm looking at the the objections of these, you know, most recent sales calls. Going, logically, timing's not the issue. Like logically, we talked about this. Like it's actually perfect timing, because it takes us 30 days to get going, and you don't have to do anything during those during those 30 days. That's perfect. Like we, it's the the time of year is perfect for this. So like logically, it's not making any sense. So then it's like, well, there's probably a deeper reason. It's probably something emotional, self doubt, whatever. And now that I'm thinking back to it, even one of the prospects on the call was like, yeah, I just got to deal with my own gremlins. I got to deal with my own voices in my head. I was like, oh, okay, mindset. Like, I just have to remember that. And it's like, that's the challenge with sales conversations is trying to figure out and diagnose that in real time, by the way, <laughs> while someone's on the phone with you and or Zoom. And, and again, you know, trying to di- diagnose that in real time and go, okay, what's the real reason you're concerned or real objection? okay, it's this, how do we try to fix that in the heat of the moment? Or can we fix it? You know, and I think too, what happens is people won't tell you the real reason, but they'll just lead you on and kind of, well, let's circle back in a month. Let's circle back in another month. And it's like, in one of these particular instances, I've been trying to close this person for about a year and a half. So that to me, also, you have to look at, here's another, I'm going to flip another lesson in here your mindset as the vendor and go, okay, if that person has waffled that much over the last 18 months, are they still going to be a really good client if you even land them? Or are they going to be a nightmare? Are they going to waffle out during the process? Like red flags, right? Like, but again, you're fighting as the business owner, you're fighting a scarcity mindset of I need revenue, I need clients, I need money, I got to pay my team, I want to grow my revenues, I have goals and financial goals and all this. And so you're hesitant to let go of it even though I know my coach, I can hear him in my head right now. He's like, you win or lose based on client selection. You want a client who's ideally I'm all in, I'm gung ho. I believe, I believe in myself. And I'm like, yeah, but those people are few and far between sometimes, you know, depending on the season of sales you're in a lot more people are like these two most recent calls where the more I talk it out loud with you, (laughs) the more I'm like, it's really probably mindset issues for them. 
And so can I go in on the sales process and fix their mindset enough in the call or address it and call it out for what it is and have them see the reality of it? Because in both cases, one client in particular, uh, or prospect, I should say, they're not client yet, you know, who said, ah, timing, 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 I'm not ready. One new sale for this person is $100,000. Okay. My, my whole done for you service is like a, fra- a tiny fraction of that, right? It's like, if we can't get you one client in 12 months of working together to pay for the whole program and the whole, like, what are we doing? Right. So it's like, logically, there's no reason the ROI is so ridiculous, right? Like you're going to get us for a year at this price. If we get you one client in 12 months of working every single day, sending out two to 300 messages a day, tracking every conversation, creating original content, chasing every lead for you, booking calls, how can that not turn into one client, right? Especially when their sales cycle is not that long or hard. Uh, it's really just like usually a, a call and they close them. I'm like, logically, that makes no sense. Like the ROI is there for you, right? And that's not the real issue then, is it? Like, that's what I have to say to myself is like, oh, the real issue is mindset. There, there's something else underneath. They're saying timing's the issue, but it's not really you know, because of all the other logical stuff we dealt with. So anyway, round and round we go. I mean, I can talk about this all day, but I knew, I thought it'd be helpful for you to listen just to kind of almost like listening in on my sales calls and the ones, it's always easy to share the wins, isn't it? And be like, oh yeah, I crushed it. I closed this and I closed that and my framework's bulletproof. And if they say this, do that. And it's like, man, get in the trenches. It's hard. It's hard, (laughs) but it is, there's so many lessons and I really think, too, at least my experience here 10 years into running my own business and doing sales for myself for 10 years and being good at it, right? Um, It's repetition and it's being in the arena and it's building momentum and it's not, not getting down or having a scarcity mindset. Like I could look at the two sales that didn't close here that I'm ranting about and say, oh man, I lost X in expected revenue. Like I thought those were done. I got a verbal yes. I sent the contract. I put in all this work. They said they're doing it. They emailed to say they're doing it. They texted to say they're doing it and they bailed. I'm going to wallow and just say, oh, I lost all this revenue. This sucks, right? Or I can do what I'm doing right now, which is process it, learn from it. What are the takeaways? Even in real time, responding to two different prospects, I got better on the second response of using the logic, the labeling, the emotional, and then, you know, trying to see if that can resurrect it. So there's always lessons in it. Winston Churchill has a great quote, you know, success consists of going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm, right? Sales is a game of failure and a game of rejection and a game of, I thought I had it and it got yanked away. Like I'm just seeing that more clearly than ever, (laughs) Uh, especially as the stakes get higher, you know, and you're doing agency work and service work and you're looking for, you know, five figure, six figure, whatever it is, like deals are big, right? And and it can be so like gut-wrenching, to be like, oh, I thought I had it done and I was celebrating and now it didn't come in. And, and that's just where like you have to have that balance of that mindset. And the other takeaway too for me that I process with my team, my business coach is I should look at this as an opportunity and be excited because the reality is there are people saying, verbally saying yes and going everywhere to the finish line to the programs I'm offering, to the price points I'm offering which are amazing, right? And which are great for the agency. So it's like, it's validating that people want to do it and are willing to spend the money and they're seeing the value in it and the logic works. It's just, again, like any sale, it could be a $10 course. It's some of the mindset stuff that, you know, I have to work on and improve for the prospect, but it, I should be encouraged and validated that, like my business coach said, when you made those offers, nobody laughed you out of the room. Nobody said, that's ridiculous. Nobody said, are you insane? Nobody said, I would never spend that much. They were like, yeah, that makes sense. One new client for me is a hundred grand and you're offering to do it for X. Yeah. Okay. Like, so, I mean it, that too, you just have to take encouragement from, right? So anyway, that's what I got. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you found it helpful. Uh, if you want a deeper dive on sales training, sales ideas, I'll put a link to some of my um, favorite sales trainings that I've put together some of my you know, live sessions, replays, and all that, uh, scripts, courses, all that good stuff in the show notes. So you can always um, go deeper on the topics. All right, thanks so much for listening. We'll see you soon on another episode. <laughs>